Amen. Thank you, choir. Yeah, thank you, choir. Gives uh, new meaning to the word choir loft, doesn't it? Well, what a great way to start off uh, the service this morning with song and uh, praise, and what a blessing it is to um, be here in the house of the Lord. We welcome you today. If you're a first-time visitor with us this morning, uh, let me just encourage you uh, today to uh, take that little tear sheet off of your bulletin, and if you'd like to uh, turn that in, if you fill it out, you can turn it in for a gift bag uh, located there at the information desk that's out in the foyer, so pretty pretty good deal there. So I just encourage you to um, take advantage of that. On the flip side of that, again, there's place there for prayer requests. And so if you would like uh, the, the pastors, the elders to talk, uh, pray for you this week. Uh, if you have a shepherd, that'll go to your shepherding elder, and uh, they'll be praying for you throughout this week. So just a word of encouragement to avail yourself of that. A couple of points uh, for our guests this morning. We do have a nursery. We do have a cry room that's located right off of the uh, foyer as well, and that has a uh, closed circuit TV in it, and that's available for parents with babies or small children that uh, get restless during the service. Also, you'll want to note that we're uh, not passing an offering plate, but we do have uh, offering boxes at the back, and if you're visiting with us today, please don't feel that you have to put anything in those. Also want just to um, mention as well, today's the last day for you to be able to sign up for the mother and daughter's luncheon, so you'll want to do that. There's a table out there, uh, and you can take care of that before you leave this morning. Uh, on another note, uh, unfortunately, Dr. Burgraff was not able to be with us this week. So if you had planned to be here on Friday and Saturday, and it just didn't work out, um, you can plan on it in two weeks, all right? So just a word of encouragement there. If you didn't get the email, you wanna make sure that you're on our list so that you get notification when something like this happens. Uh, very uh, unfortunate in some ways, unfortunate in others, I suppose. Uh, but uh, Brother Tom Zempel, someone I'm sure you don't know, he was on staff there at Shepherd Seminary in Cary, North Carolina, where Dave Burgraff is. And he passed away suddenly on Monday morning. He was out uh, running and had a heart attack, and uh, the Lord called him home. So uh, we've been talking a lot about being ready and the dead in Christ uh, preceding those who have, um, are still living, and, and he's going to proceed. So uh, he's with the Lord now, and we're thankful for his ministry. He was head of the counseling department there. Very gentle spirit, godly man. I've known Tom for over 30 years. I uh, just want to encourage you to be in prayer for his family. Uh, he has three children. Uh, his uh, youngest has Down syndrome and is very close to his dad. And so if uh, you just kind of keep them in prayer, I know they would greatly appreciate it. So, so Dave, Dr. Burgraff had to put together a memorial service. There were people coming in from around the country uh, because Dr. Zempel has been involved in different teaching ministries out in Minnesota and so forth. Uh, it was a big, it was a big uh, service yesterday, and so uh, Dave was willing to try to fly back and forth, and I said, you know, listen, just don't even worry about it. Just focus on uh, the memorial service there, and it does work out with our church schedule to have him here in two weeks. So maybe the devil doesn't want him to speak here. I don't know, but in two weeks, if you'd make uh, a note on your calendar to be here Friday night, the 13th, Saturday morning, the 14th, and then Dr. Burgraff will be speaking on the 15th, I know it'll be a blessing to you. I know it will be a, a rich blessing to you and, and a time that you won't want to miss, so uh, please mark that down on your calendars and make the notation. We won't be canceling uh, activities as we did this past week uh, leading up to that. So the schedule will kind of go along as it has, and uh, it'll just be the extra Friday night and Saturday morning. So just uh, please keep that in mind, um, and we're looking forward to that. Also, uh, catastrophic events that happen around the world. Samaritan's Purse is very involved in meeting needs head-on in a very expedited manner. And if you would like to get involved, you can go to SamaritansPurse.org and you can check out what they're doing there. They just had that major earthquake in Ecuador and if you'd like to give towards uh, the uh, projects there to help those people, you can do so directly with SamaritansPurse.org. It is May. Today's May 1st. It's hard to believe, isn't it? It's May Day, yeah. So 
Um, I don't usually like to say the words mayday, being a mariner. Um, <laughs> however, it is May, and uh, May is a transitional month. Obviously, we know that there are certain events and programs at uh, Faith that are winding down. One that's coming to uh, a close very s- shortly here is Awana. Awana is a vibrant ministry here at Faith, and it is a a rich blessing, and there's been some great things, obviously, that have happened this year uh, with the Awana program. They are our missionary for today, and you can see the, the picture of the folks there that are the representatives to our club. Dave Jarvis is our Awana commander. And uh, Dave uh, works uh, tirelessly with the Awana ministry here, he and his family. And I'm gonna ask Dave right now if he'd come and just uh, lift up uh, the Awana ministry in prayer and the missionaries that, uh, that we have as well. Dave. Morning. Uh, like you said, our missions minute is for the Awana Clubs International. Um, Awana is a Bible-based youth ministry Um, whose purpose is to reach young people with the gospel of Christ, to disciple them to know, love, and serve our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you go with me, Lord, in prayer, please. Our Father, we we ask that you provide wisdom and guidance to the leadership based out in Chicago as as they serve about 12,000 Awana clubs in the U.S. and another 10,000 clubs in roughly 100 countries around the world. May you protect this ministry, continue to provide resources and uh, missionaries and leaders. Locally, may you continue to support and empower our, um, our Awana missionaries, Chris and Sandy Mickish and Bill and Judy Bianco. Um, provide for their needs and encourage them as they work with regional churches here. Uh, I also want to lift up uh, Judy Bianco. She's having having health issues again. So Lord, please uh, watch over that uh, uh, Bill's wife. Uh, We also thank you, Lord, for blessing the Iwana Clubs here at Faith Community Church for providing kids, leaders, and resources for the ministry. Uh, Lord, may you continue using Iwana to reach, to to raise up kids, um, parents, and leaders devoted to knowing the scriptures, loving Christ, and reaching others with the gospel. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Dave. Awana is kind of an unusual word uh, for a program, uh, Awana. Uh, how many know what that stands for, Awana? Okay, how many don't have a clue, you think it's kind of weird? Um, yeah, okay. Second Timothy 2.15, you may recall uh, King James Bible, approved workmen are not ashamed, and that's the Awana uh, Uh, logo there. So we thank the Lord for what's going on with the Iwana programs, not only here in our country, but around the world as well. If you've got children uh, that are Iwana age, uh, you'll want to make sure that you get them enrolled in this great program next year when it picks up, Lord willing, in September, all right? Well, y'all are so happy this morning. I can see, even though it's rainy and drizzly and yucky outside, y'all have such a great attitude. I can see it on your faces. Stand up and say hello to some folks this morning. Greet them. giving me a hard time for saying y'all. I'm all about expediency, and that's the fastest way to say you all. So we just get to the point, right? Y'all. So, yeah, amen. Forgive me, Lord. Um, 
We're going to be in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 this morning. These fine gentlemen have a Bible and, uh, in their hand that they put in yours. If you slip up yours, they make sure that you uh, can follow along this morning. If you need a Bible and you don't have a Bible, you slip up your hand, they'll put it in your hand and make sure that um, you have it and you can take it home with you as well. Please feel free uh, to do that. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 this morning. Uh, there is a lot to be said about 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verses 12 through 28 conclude the chapter. However, this morning, what our focus is going to be on is verses 12 through 15, and we're kind of going to point in the direction of the goal of the words here, uh, wrapping things up in verse 23. And then next Sunday when we come together, we'll be dealing with all those great short verses that you got points for, for memorizing. You remember back in the day, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, um, and, and somebody gave you a red star or something for it. Uh, but uh, we'll be dealing with those and, and see how they all come together as well and kind of rally there around verse 23. So this morning, let me begin by reading verses 12 through 15 where it says, and we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the words of this passage of Scripture. And Father, the goal of this passage of Scripture being that we are at peace among ourselves. May we, Father, understand this passage in light of the context and May we seek, Lord, as your people in your church to demonstrate love and compassion for one another. Help us, Father, to truly be at peace with each other, full of the joy of the Lord and full of compassion. And Father, we might sanctify ourselves in preparation for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, to get ready for this great event and help us, Lord, to see the urgency of this passage this morning. Bless it to our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was a youngster, I started to attend church. My mother dragged me there when I was just three years old. And uh, as a young person, one of the things that I noticed in this church was the coming annually of an evangelist. I don't know how many of you were ever in a church where they had the evangelists who would come. Usually they came with a great big RV and they would usually pull into the church parking lot and they would park in the back of the parking lot. Most of the time the evangelist's wife would be homeschooling her eight children in the trailer and uh, they would be there for the whole week. And so every night you had meetings that went on and the preaching was dynamic. And I can remember as a young person inviting people to come to hear this evangelist. Evangelists had the opportunity to come and say things that no one else could say. And I think that's why pastors used to like to have evangelists come. I don't know how many times I heard an evangelist say, now listen, this is the problem, this is what you ought to do, and no, I haven't talked to your pastor. And they would say that because people would immediately assume that they were being spoken to because the pastor had ratted them out. <laughs> Sometimes the pastor did rat them out, but a lot of times he didn't. And the evangelist always made sure he pointed out the fact that the pastor hadn't ratted them out. What was amazing is that they could come and they could say whatever they needed to say because on Sunday night they hitched up their RV and phew, off they went. <laughs> And so sometimes it was very helpful. I remember um, my mother talking about an evangelist had come to the church and she still talks about that evangelist and the things that he said and how it impacted how the church operated, which was very interesting. 
Early on in ministry, I remember uh, uh, bringing in an evangelist, and I've, I've never really brought that many in, and for many, many years now, I've never done that, but I remember being a youngster and having this fellow come in that somebody had recommended. Uh, he was an interesting fellow. He was saved out of a rock band in Philadelphia. He had quite a testimony. Uh, there were uh, people that had interacted with him who were Satanists, which uh, uh, really motivated him to put his faith in Jesus Christ. He had a powerful voice uh, singing in this rock band in Philadelphia, and uh, he could preach. And I mean to tell you, he just, he just let it all go. I, I remember when he first sent me his information, and he said, uh, this is what I expect. This is what I need when I come. And he put down on there, on Sunday, he wanted lunch at 2 p.m. And I thought, that's an unusual time to eat lunch. But it really worked. Our service was at 10 a.m. and two o'clock was the perfect time for lunch because it took you that long to get back home. Uh, he preached, he, sometimes he'd preach for two hours and the women would come to me and say, Pastor Kevin, uh, we didn't have prepared uh, you know, children's ministry stuff for two hours, you know? And uh, he, he, th this fellow just went on and on. But sometimes he could say things that I couldn't say and uh, evangelists would do that. Now, the reason why I bring this, uh, this up is that the Apostle Paul, when he starts to speak here in verse 12, and as God's word comes to us, we understand that he's saying some things to address the church at Thessalonica that probably the elders there weren't able to say, or they wouldn't say it. And so when we come to this passage here for us today, it helps us because it enlightens us and it causes us to understand what the ultimate goal is. You'll see there in verse 12 where it's written, we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you, speaking about the pastors or the elders, and are over you in the Lord and these who are admonishing you. The reason that this is being given to us is at the end of verse 13, you see where it says, be at peace among yourselves. The desired goal is for there to be harmony in the body of Christ. There needs to be a peacefulness that we have among ourselves. Because ultimately, and I give you the little snapshot moving forward, in verse 23, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, what we do as a church is all in preparation for our meeting in the air with Jesus. When Jesus Christ comes back for his church, when we're taken up to be with him, we are going to be, hopefully, in a sanctified position. That is, we are seeking to prepare ourselves spiritually to be face-to-face -face with our God. And it's important for us to be concerned about that meeting. And so we work to function in such a way that brings glory to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's go back here to verse 12. And let me show you here the threefold work of the elder. Understanding, this is the first point, understanding the role of the elders and the role of the members is vital. First of all, we look at this threefold work of the elder. Paul uses three participles to explain what the elder's role truly is. The first one here is those who are laboring among you. This term is an interesting term. It ex just explains the, the nature of the work, and it describes a strenuous work. He's basically saying that pastors don't just work one day a week. Uh, he's saying here that these are those who are laboring among you. These are those who are in strenuous activity, working on your behalf and working with you. Now, these would stand out. These, these elders who are doing this work would stand out from those who in Thessalonica who were idlers, I'll call them idlers, uh, because they were just sitting on their thumbs waiting for Jesus Christ's return. Remember, that was an issue. Paul's already addressed it earlier here in 1 Thessalonians. And so they're going to stand apart. Paul makes it very clear, though. He says, these are those who labor among you. Second thing he says here are these who are over you in the Lord. These who are over you. Literally, when he says to be over you, literally it means to be at the head, to direct or to rule. In classical usage, it was used of officials in society, people who had 
areas of responsibility. And here it points to the spiritual guidance that these men are to give to God's church. When he mentions in the Lord, it describes the scope of their labored leadership. Uh, These are led by the Lord in this area, and uh, they have not usurped this leadership on their own or for their own private gain. I think it's noteworthy, if you just flip a page with me, you go back over just, uh, just one page towards the back, you'll see 1 Timothy chapter one there. And I'm reminded that these who are in a position of authority didn't seek that or should not have sought that on their own. It shouldn't be that someone wants to have the moose hat on. Uh, What they really are doing is they're following the leadership of the Lord, and that is critical, because not everyone who wants to go into full-time ministry is going to be able to do that. In fact, they cannot do that on their own. And Paul is very clear on this. In verse 12, he says, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. So let's make it really clear. Who put the apostle Paul into ministry? God did. Lord Jesus did. It wasn't like the apostle Paul wanted some great prestigious office in the church. In fact, he was persecuting the church when God tapped him on the shoulder, oh so lightly, and said, Paul. And we know that conversion was radical. It was God who then took the apostle Paul, made him an apostle. Remember, his name was Saul. It wasn't even Paul when God tapped him on the shoulder. And now he's the apostle Paul. You see, all those who would be in the ministry have been placed into the ministry by the Lord. Godly elders are going to be placed into ministry by God. And these who are serving the Lord in this way serve because of usually a unique gifting that God has equipped them with. You may recall in Ephesians, and God gave some to be apostles and prophets and pastor teachers and so forth. You see, God has gifted in a particular way. I've shared this with you in the past, but I was was 12 years old and I was at a summer camp when God tapped me on the shoulder. And I knew God was calling me to some type of full-time Christian ministry, although I did not know what. It was all part of, I believe, God's plan. And for these 30-some years that I've been involved in ministry, I've been following my God's leadership, doing what he has called me to do. So it's not unusual, this is the norm where God places people into ministry. And so within the church, we have a commonality where we all have faith in Christ, we're part of the local body of Christ, but we're also part of the universal church, the, the, the bigger body of Christ, and what God has done is he has brought giftedness to every individual local body so that he can carry out his purpose, which remember in Ephesians, the purpose is the maturing of the saints. You see, that's what God is after. And so this threefold work of the pastor or the elder here is to labor, to be overseers, and to be admonishers. Notice this third point where he says, you brethren, recognize those who labor, those who are over you, and those who admonish you. The word admonish is an interesting word. Netheto in the original means to place, literally place in one's mind. And it could mean that you're just placing truth in your teaching that here is what God's word says, but most of the time there is a connotation of correction that is actually involved. Uh, Sometimes there's a weakness perhaps in a person's life and maybe a fault, maybe an oversight, maybe a sin, and what has to happen is we need to be remembering God's position on this issue and so we come and we admonish, we place in your mind what the truth is. Now, how ma- no matter how you parse this word, netheto, it involves confrontation. It involves confrontation. And that's not the favorite job of most of us. How many enjoy confrontation? Yeah, 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 we, we just really, I, we, we'll avoid that like it was the plague. 
We don't enjoy that at all. And oftentimes, we misunderstand the role of the elder, but part of his responsibility is to admonish. The responsibility of the member, and I use that word member because I'm trying to think of a different word, but that, that's a good description. The twofold reaction to that threefold ministry of the elder within the body is first of all, notice verse 12, to recognize that person or to know that person or as the New American Standard translates it, to appreciate that person. Now it's an interesting term because the word recognize in the New King James is actually the Greek word oida which is, there's two Greek words for to know and that's a very, very common one. But it's interesting that he uses this word to know here in this context. Now, if you dig around, you find out uh, that this is a, a, a word that was supported in the original, some of the classical Greek writings. Literally, it speaks to recognizing someone's work with an attitude of appreciation. So that's why he uses it here. And so the obligation of the member is to know what in the world the responsibility of the elders is. To understand that it's their job to labor among us. It's their job to be leaders among us. It's their biblical responsibility to admonish us, you see. And so the member is to know that. He's to understand that. And he is to appreciate those who do this kind of work. Second thing he says here in verse 13, they are to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Now to esteem means to think or to consider, to give careful consideration of. There's two points here that are very important. One is if you're going to think of these people and to, to esteem them, to consider them, he says that you ought to very highly esteem them, to very highly, to, to value them, and literally it means to be above all measure, to think of them in the highest regard. I remember back in, the, back in the 80s, we were buying our first house, or second house, I guess it was maybe our first house, and uh, it was a really, it was an expensive house, it was like $50,000, and, and I remember going to the attorney, and I remember the attorney saying, are, are you a, an ordained minister? And I said, yes. And he said, well, then you can take the title reverend. And I said, nah, I don't like that word. Um, but he said, you know, he said, there are three honorable professions that historically have been among American society. One is a lawyer, one is a doctor, and one is a minister. And that's just stuck with me. And it's amazing how that has changed, though, over the years. And I'm not just talking about the lawyer. <laughs> In order for the church to work and to work well, this aspect of highly esteeming those who are called to be in a position of leadership. Remember, we're not looking for this leadership. God has called us to this position. In order for it to work and for it to work well, we have to understand how important the dynamic is that Paul is speaking of here. Consider the need that you or I might have to be admonished. Have you ever needed to be admonished? Have you ever been admonished? If you've ever been admonished, you probably remember it. I, I remember back in my college days, my pastor coming to me because he heard something about me and he came and he admonished me. I still remember that, I remember that well. It was a hilarious situation in some ways. Um, but he had a good point and it stuck with me. Someday I'll tell you about it. What is your immediate reaction when you are rebuked or admonished? Usually we're so thankful, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> 
Bruce and brother, listen, sister, I, you know, I really appreciate your coming to tell me this. No, not at all. What we usually do is we usually rebel immediately, where there's usually an excuse, there's usually a reason, we usually blame someone else, we usually play the victim card, we do everything we possibly can to get out from under this situation. Whew. And the irony is that pastors who are called to admonish who love the idea, <laughs> find themselves not wanting to carry out their responsibility because they know the backlash that comes from admonishment. Do you see how important this all has to be? You see, if you take someone and you value them and you esteem them very highly for their work's sake, you can better receive that admonishment if it's necessary at some point in your life. I don't know how many times I've said to people who have complained about their church or complained about their pastor, I remember somebody saying to me, oh, this pastor, and he went on, and, and the pastor wasn't qualified to be in ministry. There were certain sinful situations that were going on that were, were very uh, disturbing. And I remember saying to this person, if you fell into some type of sin and you needed to be admonished and that pastor came and knocked on your door, would you listen to what he has to say? And he said, absolutely not. I wouldn't let him in. I said, you need to go find a church where you can let him in. Why? Because the body of Christ needs to be preserved and it needs to be sanctified for the honor and glory of the Lord. You see, this next part here at the end of verse 13 is so important to understand. Be at peace, he said, among yourselves. I believe he's speaking there about the church body, a church body just like this, where we love each other, we support each other, we encourage each other. That is absolutely vital because it's looking towards verse 23 that we be prepared when Jesus Christ comes. I was reading the story about this church and churches are in disarray, not only here in the United States but around the world. I remember hearing stories when I was teaching in Africa <clears throat> about Africans who changed the locks on the doors of the church because they were fighting factions within the church. People would show up, they'd try to get into church on Sunday and they couldn't do it. Uh, just, uh, I believe it was last week, there was a shooting up in North Wales, Pennsylvania at a, at a church there. there. Somebody came in, they were very belligerent and angry and so forth, and someone came over, tried to calm them down, and instead they just shot them. You say, that's crazy. Down in Alabama, there's a story that happened last week where the, the church leaders tried to to fire the pastor, but the pastor wouldn't leave, and so when they all showed up for church, the, the doors were locked in the church, and the people broke the doors down, and there was a big fight uh, that took place inside, and the police were actually on scene because they anticipated that there was going to be a problem, and the people started fighting inside the church, and somebody pulled out a knife and started cutting other people, and then somebody hit him over the head with a chair. You see, that's the exact opposite of what this passage is talking about. How are those people going to be able to be prepared when Jesus Christ returns? Where's the process of sanctification in their life? Where is that godly spirit that needs to be there, you see? And what God's word is saying, be at peace among yourselves because we have a role in this world and we are looking forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus. Things shift a little bit here in verse 15. If you notice with me, he says, now we exhort you, brethren, Warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with all. You see, I believe here he's shifted things again in verse 14 where he says, now we exhort you, brethren. Ephesians chapter six references the brethren when it says, brethren, even if anyone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one according to to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. He says there's a responsibility not only for the pastors to be in that position of leadership and they are called to admonish, but I love this part, you're called to admonish too. You say, oh, Pastor Kevin, I thought just the pastors were supposed to be confrontational. 
No, you see, the scriptures actually teach that we as members of the same body are to care for each other and we're to jump into action as we see the needs arise. In fact, as you look at verse 14, he's going to say here, now we exhort you brethren, he says, warn those who are unruly. And again, that same Greek word that applied to the elders uh, Nutheto to admonish or place in one's mind is actually used here again. And he says what we need to be doing is to be placing in those people's minds uh, the truth, these who are unruly. The word unruly is uh, a military term. It means to be out of step. Out of step. You know how everybody when they're marching one particular direction and somebody else just doesn't get it right? and uh, they're out of step, or, or the, whole, uh, the, the whole rank is, is going one direction, and they're playing, you know, in their mind something else, and they're wandering off. Uh, that's the idea, that you're wandering off from the path that is what God has laid out, and in that way, you are unruly. In ancient writings, this term uh, for unruly or disorderly is actually translated in a few places, idle. And you remember, you had idlers, I'll call them idlers, you had idlers in the Thessalonican church, people who were sitting on their thumbs waiting for Christ to return. Paul's already rebuked them earlier in this book. These are people who are out of step, and he says that when you notice that person is out of step, you, you, you want to come around that person, and you want to place in their mind. And this is not just a responsibility for the elders, but for all of us. Say, oh, I saw so-and-so, and they're out of step. I'm calling Pastor Kevin on the phone. Now, go talk to them yourself. You see, if we handle it on a, on a much more intimate level, it works so much better than all of a sudden you have an elder at your door knocking at your door some evening. You see, we are called upon because we're looking towards verse 23 and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're committed to, to seeking the best that we can and we want the body to reflect Christ in all things and so we're concerned about the unruly. Like I mentioned, it's not out of the realm of reality that we would be needing admonishment at some point. Second thing he says here is that we're to encourage the faint-hearted. It's a different term here, this word for faint-hearted. Uh, literally, it means a, a small-souled one. And not a S-O-L-D, but a S-O-U-L-D, or L-E-D. He says the small-souled one. This is one who is depressed or discouraged. He said that person may be discouraged and they need to be comforted. Maybe they are discouraged because of the persecution that's taking place in Thessalonica. Not an easy place. And maybe they're discouraged because their loved ones, to some degree, had passed on. They didn't think that was going to happen. They weren't mentally prepared for it. Maybe they're discouraged over that. Maybe they've lost their source of income because now their new faith in Christ doesn't allow them to sell those trinkets that the false gods uh, worshiper people would come and buy. I don't know the case, but I know that every single one of us at some time in our life has been small-souled. We've been discouraged. And he's not saying here that we need to come along with these people and rebuke them or correct them. Instead, these people need to be cheered on. They need to be given hope and encouraged. That's what I need when I'm discouraged. That's what I need when I don't see the hope. I need to be reminded of the hope. And so he says, listen, you need to comfort these who are faint-hearted. The third thing that he says we need to be doing is we need to uphold the weak. And the word here, uphold, could also be translated support. It's not speaking here about a physical weakness. It's not talking about a, a person who has a physical need. It's really talking about maybe there's a moral or a, a spiritual weakness that's there in their life. And the word support or uphold literally means to hold one's self over against. That is, to come alongside of someone and hold them up. 
Maybe it could be a soldier who's been wounded in the leg, they need some help. Maybe it's a, a football player who's being carted off the field, or in this case, a, a marathon runner who just hit the wall, and they need a little bit of help coming alongside of that person, coming against the side of that person to put your arm around them and hold them up. This is the help for the weak. And the Christians there in Thessalonica needed to help each other because it's not always simplistic to live for Christ. There are challenges that we face all the time. And sometimes we need to be rebuked. Sometimes we just need to be helped. Sometimes we need to be comforted. It's all a different level at different times. The last thing he says is that we need to exercise patience. He says be patient with all. You need to be patient with those who are having struggles, maybe those who are idle, maybe those who are faint-hearted, maybe those who are weak. The word long-suffering means to be long-tempered, and it is God who is ultimately long-tempered, isn't it true? You and I are supposed to have the same characteristic or the same mindset as our God, who is long-suffering. I just got through reading a passage of scripture that God says the reason that uh, he, God is tarrying and coming with the judgment is not that the world doesn't need judgment or is worthy of being judged. It's not that God has uh, just delayed it for no significant reason. No, the reason why God hasn't returned yet, why Jesus Christ, we haven't heard that trumpet, is because God knows that there's still people who are going to choose Christ. And he's long-suffering because those people he wants to add to the body of Christ. Isn't that fantastic? And so if God can be long-suffering, don't you think the world is kind of rotten and worthy of judgment? Well, God turns around and says, wait, I'm not gonna judge them yet because there's people over here that I wanna add that I know that are gonna come to faith in me. And so you and I are called to exhibit the same type of long-suffering that God exhibits. You and I are to be patient with all. You, you see, even within a room like this, there are people who are at all different levels spiritually. Some are brand new Christians, perhaps, just recently placed their faith in Jesus. Others are, are 50 years into a Christian walk. But, but we're at different levels, and maybe there's, there's issues that are different in all of our lives. We know that that's true. And so God says we need to be patient with everyone. I don't meet too many people who say that patience is not an issue for me. Most of the time, we agree that we're weak on patience. We just don't have a lot of it. We don't have much at all sometimes. And yet God is patient with us. And he says, listen, this is the way it should be in the church. Leading up to verse 15, it brings us to that next part. He says, see that no one renders evil for evil. And that word uh, see is to be careful, to, to be careful in making sure that, that no one who is wronged turns around and reciprocates that wrong in the body of Christ. There are times when you are going to cause trouble for someone. There are times when you might say something about someone that you shouldn't have said, or you may do something that is out of character of the follower of Christ. But at no point are you and I justified in rendering an evil for an evil. Instead, what we're supposed to do is the opposite. He says, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. The word pursue means to follow after. It's a, a present tense imperative. I mean, you gotta do it and you gotta keep on doing it. It's going to be difficult to do at times, uh, but it's a worthy goal. And this word pursue, it could be used as a, a, a person pursues and they oftentimes use it, uh, translate it in a context of someone who's hunting uh, their prey. Uh, but it's also used as, uh, as a word and translated persecute. The idea is to go hard after something. And that's what people who are persecuting others do. They go hard after that person. You and I are called upon to pursue good things for everyone else, good things even for ourselves. We're to go hard after that. As we see the day of the Lord approaching, as we see the, the day coming nearer and nearer when Christ is going to be face to face with us, we need to pursue that which is profitable for one another. You see, when Christ returns, we want to have a church 
that demonstrates Christ's likeness to its greatest capacity. And that's what this is all about. We want to do our best because we recognize verse 23 and the reality of that, which says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Are you going hard after that which is good for one another? I trust that we'll be ready for the Lord. That we'll be walking in that right direction. No, you can't be perfect. But boy, you can be absolutely committed. Maybe you're here this morning and you've yet to place your faith in Jesus. That, that may be your situation. Uh, that's not unusual. Uh, none of us came into this world not needing the Lord and needing salvation. But maybe you're here today and you've never called upon his name. The best thing that you can do is at this point in time, set aside those things that you've had your faith based upon. Maybe it was good works, maybe it was, was your family heritage, maybe it's uh, another religion, but you're willing to put all that aside and place your faith, your weight of your, your, your eternity in Jesus. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But you've gotta believe that Jesus is God, that he paid the penalty for our sin on the cross. He rose from the dead, as Romans 10 says. Place your faith and trust in him and in him alone. That is the first step to being ready for his coming in verse 23. Have you made that decision? Have you placed your faith in Jesus and in him alone? If you have never done that, this is a perfect day, believe me, to make that decision to trust Christ. And if you're trusting Christ, I trust that your commitment will be towards the church, his body, and that you'll follow through with what we've been talking about here this morning so that you can see progress in your Christian life, so much so that you're anxious for the return of Jesus in verse 23. Let's pray, shall we? Would you stand with me, please? Father in heaven, we thank you, we praise you, for there is none like you. You have given to us, Lord, the reason for hope, and that hope is Jesus Christ. And Lord, if there are those here today who are unsure of where they'll spend their eternity, Father, may they today decide to place their faith and trust in you. May they call upon your name. And Father, I pray that if there are those who have questions, that they would seek out the counselors here at the front to find answers from your word. Help us, Lord, this morning as followers of yours, Lord, to understand the significance, the importance of the things that have been mentioned in this passage of scripture. Understanding, Lord, how we should act so that we are at peace among ourselves, bringing you glory. We thank you, Father, for your church. We thank you, Father, for the blessings that we have in Christ. May we determine in our own hearts to live for you and bring you glory, for you alone are worthy. Give us a, a week of victory, I pray. Help us, Father, to honor you in all things. In Christ's name, amen.